If there's ever a time where we needed to pull together as believers of Christ and, and unite and try to strengthen and make the world a better place, it's now. Mm-hmm. And that, that sounds like he's yeah. preaching our message. <laughs> there's one body, one church, one spirit, one hope. The realities of the faith, the realities that unify us are already there. Christ prays for right. unity. What should we all be praying for? Mm-hmm. I mean, it's the one prayer request of Jesus. Think about it in the Bible that we actually have a say in whether or not it comes to fruition or not. I think in what God has done in you guys in, uh, in this podcast and the, the multitude of folks that you're reaching, the diversity, whatever God intended when, he's, when you started this, he's able to bring it to completion. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Whole Church Podcast. I am one of the co-hosts, Joshua Knoll, here with your other co-host, TJ Tiberius Juan Blackwell. Present. Yeah, and we're also here with another extremely special guest, um, Dr. Greg Allison, author of The Historical Theology, plenty of other stuff. Um, We're going to talk to him some about the relationship of the Protestant church with the Catholic church, as well as the importance of historical theology concerning church unity. So some really big topics. We're going to see how much we can cram in our time today. So uh, we'll go ahead and get to it. Uh, Before anything else, I want to say a big thank you to all of our patrons over on Patreon. Um, And of course, we always like to start by reviewing some of our followers' responses online. Um, uh, So we asked the silly question, our Friday silly question, if um, you had to guess one appliance in your kitchen was a transformer, which appliance would you most suspect? And both Amber and Alex said their dishwasher um, with the caveat that the dishes must be loaded or else it you know, it's out of ammo, so it won't work. (laughs) So that was their answer. Um, And with that, we'll go ahead and jump into today's. All right. So uh, today's silly question, silly question for this week. Uh, If you had your own town, what would you name it? So I'm okay with going first. If that's not a problem. I I just wrote that down. (laughs) Uh, uh, If I had a town, I would name it Halcyon. Because Halcyon means idyllic, like a, a golden era. So kind of wishful thinking probably, but, you know, it's nice to be wishful when you're founding a city. So, yeah, yeah, I, um, I was, I wasn't going to use this because I heard you say it and this was the first thought I had. And then I was like, oh, that's too obvious. And then I realized it's only obvious to like me and like a handful of other people um, back in college. Uh, A group of us used to play this kind of role play tabletop game. And uh, one of us had his own nation titled that he called Freiheit, which is just German for liberty. So uh, I'm going to go with that because that was just a it was a major part of some fun civilization building for us. Um, Dr. Allison, uh, if you had to name your own town. okay, uh, you know, the literary figure Alice in Wonderland. Uh, right. My I will book. name my city Allison Wonderland hmm. because my hmm. last name is Allison. Nice. Hmm. Uh, yeah. yeah. That is a big Alice sure. Wonderland. Right. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> nice. That nice. Sounds- That's a good one. All right. Well, <laughs> uh, there's there's so Allison that, uh, Wonderland merch all, all around his office. I don't know if you can see it, but it is there. <laughs> okay. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So recently, I just read your book with um, Chris Castaldo. Um, I didn't. Did I say that right? Is it Castaldo? Castaldo, yep. Castaldo, okay. Um, which we we reference some of your other books often, but I just finished the one um, with him that you wrote, The Unfinished Reformation. So we want to ask you a couple questions about that work. Um, for starters, could you just unpack kind of the title for our listeners? Like, what, what do you mean, Unfinished Reformation? So the book uh, came out in 2017 on the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation. And uh, so the question we raised was, after 500 years, uh, do we still have an ongoing Reformation? And in a way, the answer is no, because that is a historical event. Uh, Our context is quite a bit different from what it was 500 years ago. Like Protestants are no longer killing Catholics and Catholics are no longer killing Protestants and things like that. And so the answer is no, but the answer is also yes. Uh, the, the, the Reformation is ongoing because there, while there's still a lot that unite Roman Catholics and Protestants, there still remain a lot of divergences, a lot of areas in which we differ. 
And so we need to continue to think through and work through this whole idea of the Reformation. Yeah. Um, was it the Council of Trent that was kind of the Catholic um, response to the Reformation? Is that, is that right? It's exactly um, right. Starting in 1546 and going on for a couple decades, that was the official Roman Catholic response to the Protestant Reformations. Yep. Okay. So this is just sort of a personal question I've always kind of wondered about. Um, it seems to me that the Catholic Church has kind of sidestepped a lot of what they said there. Um is that still like firm doctrine for them, like everything that was said at the Council of Trent, or do they um, – how do they treat that now? It still uh, is the – part of the official view of the Roman Catholic Church. It still is very formative for Roman Catholic theology. Uh, you read through the current catechism of the Catholic Church. There's constant reference to the Council of Trent, for example, on the doctrine of Scripture, the canon of the Old Testament, justification, Mary, different things like that. So we, it still remains uh, in effect t- today, but a lot of contemporary Catholics don't really adhere to it. Um, there's a lot more toleration, a lot more ambiguity in Catholic belief and things like that. So uh, it's it's officially uh, the formation, the formative uh, foundation for the Roman Catholic theology and practice, but a lot of people aren't aware of it or ignore it. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. So you wrote that book, and you also wrote another book about um, kind of the Protestant view of the catechisms. Um, have you learned anything new while you were writing these books and kind of doing the research for them? Well, one thing is uh, both Chris Castaldo in our book, The Unfinished Reformation, and in the book that I wrote, a standalone book called Roman Catholic Theology and Practice and Evangelical Assessment. We, we both in both books, we underscore the, the many areas of unity that exist between Roman Catholic theology and evangelical or Protestant theology, the doctrine of the Trinity, the doctrine of Jesus, the doctrine of the Holy Spirit, uh, different things like that. So we, we, um, we, we were fascinated by the fact that there still remains a lot of agreement. There are many things that unite Roman Catholics and Protestants, even after 500 years. But there are, like I said earlier, there are ongoing differences that, that it still divide us. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So. We have both Protestant and Catholic listeners. Um, had a few different guests from the Catholic Church who've been on and kind of talked about the differences between our churches and that kind of stuff. Um, what advice could you give just to like the lay people of the church on both sides on how to um, better navigate and kind of talk about some of the issues between our churches amongst one another? I would say I would love to see our Protestant listeners and our Roman Catholic listeners, if they're in the same lo- basic location, get together and do Bible study together. I think that would be a really good way of bringing these two diverse denominations, if you will, together and focusing on Scripture. Uh, I would suggest really focusing on passages in the four Gospels, who Jesus is and what he has done. I think that would be a really good way of bringing our Roman Catholic and Protestant listeners together. Another suggestion would be uh, for uh, our listeners to grab a hold of the Catechism of the Catholic Church. And then my book, Roman Catholic Theology and Practice and Evangelical Assessment, uh, read sections of the Catechism, read sections in my book, then that treat that section in the Catechism, and then have really open, honest, humble discussions. What do we agree on? And, and where do we diverge and why do we diverge? Why are we different on these things? And just have a real civil dialogue. I, I think that would be very valuable. Oh, yeah. I um, And this is just, you know, a personal observation. I might just be way off base. I'm, I, you know, can't be completely sure. But my own experience going to a Pentecostal church growing up there, a lot of people in our church kind of seemed like um, Catholicism as a whole is almost taboo, you know. And um, even as we started this podcast and we wanted to share our podcast with some more Catholic believers and I found some Catholic groups on Facebook and they seemed very negative towards the Protestant church in general without it. It didn't seem like they really knew what we believed. And uh, is there a way past the taboo? I mean, is there a way past that? Uh, Yeah, we're like two ships passing each other in the night because we've never dialogued Uh, Roman Catholics don't really think about and study Protestant theology and practice. 
Same thing, Protestants rarely study and think about Roman Catholic theology and practice. So we've got these very strange misunderstandings, misrepresentations of one another. And, and so we, yeah, like ships passing in the night, we get angry and we, we criticize one another. And, and this is the whole idea of sitting down around the Bible and having Bible study or actually looking at the catechism and looking at, say, my assessment of it and dialoguing so that we can actually understand what Catholics believe and what Protestants believe and where we're united and where we diverge. I think that would be helpful. Okay. One more tricky question and then I'll let, I'll let TJ ask what he needs to ask. <laughs> I, um, we recently, we, we talked to professor Chris Moreland and uh, father Jonathan Metasophia, um, one of the Catholic church and one of uh, father Jonathan is of the um, Orthodox church. And we were talking some about kind of the books of the Bible that Protestants don't observe that they do. Um, is it possible or even useful? Do you think for, Protestant believers to sit down and read some of these other books. Oh, absolutely. So the apocryphal writings like Judith and uh, Tobit, First and Second Maccabees, I, I think they're valuable even for Protestants to read. First and Second Maccabees uh, really recounts the history of the Jewish revolt against pagan forces about 180 BC, and then uh, the, the, these two writings, First and Second Maccabees, were written around 125 BC. They're excellent records of this Jewish revolt. So I think that's helpful. Warning then to Protestants, but you come to Second Maccabees chapter 12, and here's where you've got the passage that becomes the foundation for the Roman Catholic view of purgatory, saying masses for the dead, praying for the dead, different things like that. So just going in alert to the fact that uh, there's a lot of good things in these apocryphal writings. But there's some things that Protestants need to be aware of and pay attention to. But I encourage my students uh, to read th these books. There, There's wonderful stories of courage and hope and facing persecution and love and things like that. So uh, even Luther and Calvin and the reformers who rejected these apocryphal writings, they said, but but these can be read by believers for edification and and for benefit. Yeah. How do you feel about First Enoch? That's a pseudo epigraphal <laughs> book, right? So that's yeah. not part of the apocryphal book. But uh, First Enoch is quoted uh, right in Jude, and uh, yeah, it's it's a strange book. <laughs> so right? interesting. So there's a lot to talk about there about Enoch. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But there's right. So Enoch didn't write it, right? We we know that it's a pseudo epigraphal book, but uh, yeah, that does form right some of the background for us to understand our New Testament. So it can be helpful in terms of context, historical context. Yeah. Now, right. just so everybody knows, Enoch is not in the Catholic or Orthodox Bibles either, right. but yeah. it is interesting. Yeah. And there's a citation or an allusion to it in Jude. So yeah, uh, obviously as well, the right? authors knew it. What's that? Isn't it in Second Peter too? One of the Peters? It could be. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. All right. So uh, we have a show or we have a segment a <laughs> series on our show. Uh, we call the dividing scriptures where we talk about the most divisive scriptures in the Bible. Uh, we're going chronologically. So naturally we haven't made it out of Genesis yet. Uh, <laughs> it's been a couple months. Uh, yeah. but how do you think what we, what we do is we talk about these scriptures and how they've been argued, you know, either side of throughout history or, you know, all sides of, uh, do you think it would, how do you think it would be helpful for our listeners to, hear those like different points of view on these scriptures. I think it's very valuable. Uh, just take for one example, Matthew 16, 13 to 20 on this rock, I will build my church. The gate of hate gates of Hades will not prevail against it. Things like that. Hmm. Obviously Roman Catholic theology and Protestant theology have very, very different interpretations of this passage. Right. Roman Catholicism turns to this to support the idea of Peter, right, uh, being the, uh, the, the, the supreme apostle, right? Uh, eventually his office will develop into the office of the papacy. The Pope will be the successor of Peter. He'll have the gift of infallibility, things like that. And, 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 and that's all grounded on that one passage, Protestant theology. Uh, will take a very different view. It will deny that uh, Peter had this supreme location or su supreme position. 
and that the early church viewed all the bishops as being equal and the Pope in Rome didn't develop into the sixth century. And, and, and so, but, but the big point your I think your question is, does this help your listeners? Yes, it does, because it helps them understand why Roman Catholics believe and practice what they do today and why Protestants believe and practice what they do today. And I think that's always important for our listeners to understand. Mm -hmm. And it's also super helpful for us to unify, right? Uh, well, if if we if we don't un we, we don't unify at all costs, but if there is truth and understanding, and we see that there are still points that unify us, definitely we should we should understand that point. Right. Yeah. Hey guys, we just wanted to take a quick break to tell you a few ways that you can support. The Whole Church Podcast, your favorite Church Unity podcast. Yeah, so you can sign up for our newsletter at our website or by emailing us at thewholechurch at gmail.com. You can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. You could share this episode on your own social media. You could donate to us on Cash App with the tag that's in the show notes. You could follow us on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash the Whole Church Podcast. You can subscribe to this show wherever great podcasts are found. Or you could rate us on Apple Podcasts or Podchasers. Especially that last one. It's a really great way for us to get recognition, not only from the community, but from people looking to find new good podcasts. Yeah. So let's get back to the show then. Yeah. So would you say observing the historical arguments could help us argue better today? Or is that just one of those you know, happened then and we should move on today kind of things or? Oh, I think, I think history exerts an enormous influence over what we believe and practice today. So I think we really need to understand where we've come from and and why we have these different views on the Pope and papacy, on justification, on scripture and things like that. And so to look back and uh, garner what we can from historical theology, from wisdom from the past, is extremely important for us. We can't understand why there are these two, or if you will, three, including (laughs) Eastern Orthodox, three major branches. We can't understand unless we have a firm understanding of what's happened historically. Yeah. Yeah. And um, and for our listeners, you probably are familiar with Greg Allison's name a lot in some of these topics. Um, For the series TJ was talking about, the Dividing Scripture series, we often will use some of uh, your book, The Historical Theology and Introduction to Christian Theology. We use that to kind of give us a framework and then hopefully we're able to do a little bit more research and build on top of it when we talk about some of these subjects. And um, it's been very helpful to us. Um, I wonder, what would you say that history can teach us about modern ecclesiology or how the church should be governed today? Well, we go back uh, to the fourth century and uh, some of the early creeds. Uh, there's an affirmation that the church is one, holy, Catholic, and apostolic. That is how the church self-identified very early on in its history. And I think what's really important, those four attributes, uh, one, holy, Catholic, apostolic, they focus on what the church is in terms of its nature, in terms of its characteristics, its identity markers, its nature. The early church defined itself in terms of its nature or essence. Contrast that with what we do today when we talk about the church. We define the church in terms of its ministries, its roles. The church is about worship, discipleship, uh, mentoring, women's Bible studies, men's Bible studies, children's ministries. We talk about what we do, but I think we're just we're wrong headed in this. We need to understand first and foremost what the church is, its nature, its essence. And then out of that, when we have that biblical theological vision, then we build up what the church actually does. And so just from this early creedal statement about the church, we learn how to define the church, how how to conceptualize the church. It's what the church is before what the church does. That to me, that alone uh, helps me understand the importance of church history or wisdom from the past. So 
Would you, would you say that the church has basically become so pragmatic that it sacrificed some of its principles? Absolutely. That's that, that is that's it. We are with the last 50, 75 years so pragmatically oriented and driven that we've lost sight of what we are. And so what happens when you're a church planter? You take what you did, the ministries, the programs you did at the mother church, and you reproduce them wherever you go to plant your church. But you do so because that's the way we've done it in the mother church. This is the way we're going to do it in the daughter church. But what if the context is different? What yeah. if those programs don't work in the new location? We, we, we just we have this air then of just reproducing programs and activities without understanding why we do it and how what the church is and how it should express itself differently in different contexts. Hmm. Mm-hmm. So I'm, I'm sorry. Um, I, I'm going to compound my next two questions so that we can move on. <laughs> if, um, so, so I wonder then if, if you think getting away from being overly pragmatic would help us be more united. And I also was wondering if you could um, maybe expound on what those four ideas you named were um, being one apostle. I can never say that word. Yeah. 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 (laughs) And holy. Yeah. Will this help us to be more united? At least if we had respect for wisdom from the past and if we could understand where we come from, I think that would go a long way in dispelling these myths and misunderstandings that we have towards one another, would that produce greater unity? I'm not sure it could, but it certainly would enable us to sit down at a table and have civil dialogue with understanding and respect. And I think that's really important today. Is the pragmatic mindset getting in the way of unity? I I, I think so. I, I think it can. Um, you know, it's it's yeah, I, I think it can because we just we're just focusing on programs and activities. And then we we compare here are the programs and activities at your Protestant church. Here's your programs and activities at your Roman Catholic church. Ooh, they look quite a bit different. So does that mean that they're at the heart of it? They're really different in terms of two different churches. I think it clouds the issue hmm. in, in terms of one holy Catholic and apostolic. So the church is one that is. There's only one church of Jesus Christ, right? And uh, w- the early church really emphasized oneness in doctrine, right? Yeah. The, 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 the church, wherever it appears, holds to sound doctrine. You know, we believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord, conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? And so, so there's oneness in terms of our of our doctrine, and we're we're the body of Christ, we're the temple of the Holy Spirit. There's only one, uh, one holy. So the church is composed of pure, born again believers, right? So the early church insisted that its members had to be not just professing Christians, but actually saved believers. And I think that's very important. And the whole idea that the church is pure, it's our position it's also the goal towards which we are shooting. And, and so we pursue that by be, trying to be more holy and sanctified and all like that. So one holy Catholic, small c, means universal. So, right, the church is constantly expanding as it preaches the gospel and starts new churches. Our prayer and our hope for our generation is that one day soon, Right. The gospel will be preached and churches planted in every corner of the globe. It's never happened before, but that's what we're working for. We won't rest until it happens. One holy Catholic apostolic founded on the apostles. That is specifically their words, uh, which we would call scripture, the the word of God. So the church is grounded on is founded on on uh, the Bible, the word of God. One holy Catholic apostolic. Hmm. All right. Uh, was there ever a time in church history you think that unity seemed more attainable than it does today? And was it pre Martin Luther? It's a good, it's a, it's a tricky question though. Um, I don't want to idealize right. what the early church, the medieval church, Reformation church actually was because I know, oh, even redeemed Christians uh, are still weighted down by sin. 
and we're prone towards divisiveness. And I don't think we're necessarily any more sinful or less sinful than people before. So I know the church has always been racked by its sin. Uh, I know the evil one, Satan, uh, loves to destroy the church. So, so you've got that factor. And I don't think he's necessarily ever let up. And then you've got the world in which the church is planted, right? In which the church exists. And it's always been against the church. So you've got our own flesh, our own sinful nature. You've got the evil one. You've got uh, the reality of the world. And and I, I just think to idealize the church in the past and say that's when the church was really united, maybe overlooking that important component. Having said that, though, I would say the early church really did emphasize the importance of unity, oneness, right? One holy Catholic apostolic. There's only one church. And it stood very firmly against heretical churches and really tried to guard itself from these heresies, like denials of Jesus's full deity, denials of Jesus's full humanity, denials of the Trinity. The, the early church, it seemed, was more sharp in terms of trying to repulse this evil and this divisiveness and wrong doctrine. So maybe, maybe, maybe the early church <laughs> was more united. But then you come to, right, the Eastern split with the Catholic and Eastern split, in, you know, a thousand years ago. You come to the Reformation 500 years ago. So the splits have been formalized, right? So right. now we talk about yeah. three branches. So maybe in a, let's not get too over idealized, but there's probably some truth to the fact that in the early church, there was more unity than we have today. Yet there was still a lot of junk going on as well. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And then when they split, it seemed like there was a lot more violence in some of the splits today. Like the Methodist church split, it's going to split, but I don't think they're going to kill each other. <laughs> But th that is an advantage. We're, we're not yeah. killing one another, right? So, <laughs> We've laid down those arms. Right. But, you know, you wonder, yeah, but there's still a lot of slander yeah. and a lot of bitterness and mm -hmm. anger oh, going yeah. on. Oh, yeah. Right. So, uh, you know, my last question for you, you know, before outro end of show stuff uh, is just one for you. Uh, is there has there ever been a question that you always wanted to be asked in an interview that no one ever asks? Um, why do I love teaching systematic theology? People right. usually don't ask that. So I'm a systematic theologian. And can I answer my own question? <laughs> uh, I, hope so. <laughs> absolutely. I, I love to teach what Christians believe. So doctrine based on scripture, uh, considering wisdom from the past, because I love to see my students. I love to see their eyes sparkle. I love to see the light go on in their heads. I love to see the doctrine of the Trinity change the way they worship and, and who Jesus is and what he's done, help them grasp what the gospel is and what sanctification is all about in terms of their own personal growth and discipleship of others in their church. I love to see uh, sound doctrine based on scripture with wisdom from the past just uh, change my students' lives. I, I love that. And that's one of the reasons I love being a systematic theologian and teaching systematic theology. Awesome. Yeah. yeah my, um, my systematic theology professor has been on the show a couple of times, uh, Dr. Peter Beck. Um, oh, yeah. Well, you know he's one of my students. Nice. Yeah, he's one of my favorite guys. I, I love yeah. that guy. I, um, man, th there's so, just so much I learned from him really. And um, having grown up Pentecostal and being, more of the analytical mindset. It was really revolutionary for me whenever I, I took his class and I learned, wait a minute, I can worship with theology. Yep, <laughs> and, exactly. Um, I don't know. It, it really changes things. Um, and, and I do think if, if even if you're not going to go to seminary, if people listening, if you just really love God and are really interested in, it, and you have the opportunity to take a systematic theology class or even just like a seminar or something, do it. It's worth it. Um, yeah, there's so many resources, so many good resources out there. You can do classes online. You you can just pick up books and, and just read good theology and see if that will just change your life. YouTube oh, yeah. top ten things to know about systematic theology. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure there's yeah. something there. 
There's the problem. Yep. <laughs> I, I, there's just and there's so many things that like if you read it on your own, it'll mean something to you, but not quite what it could mean if you knew all the things that are out there with it. Um, was it the sons of God in Genesis? <laughs> Is that what, that's a uh, man. You, you have no idea how much is behind that phrase until you really look at it, which we'll be talking about soon, actually, with uh, Dr. Michael Heiser is going to be on the show. So that'll be interesting. <laughs> he's the man to talk about that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He's. Um, yeah, I've been I've been reading some of his books and stuff trying to prepare and I'm like, ah, I'm just trying to keep it all in my head. <laughs> yep. Yep. Um, yeah. So we always like to end our episodes. So now, now we're not singling you out anymore for for what you do and what you know. This is the stuff we ask everybody. <laughs> we always like to ask if you just had to give a single tangible action for, you know, our regular listeners, just regular lay people. Average Joe goes to church. What's something that he could do that's tangible that would help maintain church unity? First, within his or her own local church, be as supportive as you can of the the pastor or pastors, the leaders of the church, the direction of the church, philosophy of ministry of the church, serve in your local church, pray for it, really work to maintain the unity of the church, uh, which the Holy Spirit establishes, Ephesians 4, 3, and, and, and really avoid building up frustration and anger and bitterness by not talking to your leaders about what you're experiencing. See if you can clear the air. So, so that would be just on a local church level. And then just on a broader level, um, kind of what we talked about before, engage your family members, your friends, your neighbors who may have a different religious persuasion than you. Sit down and talk with them, understand what they believe, explain what you believe, and, and talk about things that unite you explain the things that divide you and why and 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 be humble listen well and seek to uh understand one another there, there, there's so much in our society there's so much in our church that works against that i would just urge our listeners to just uh, those couple things right yeah. uh, what do you think we would see change in you know the church if people started doing that well i mean just speaking as a leader in my own church if people would come to me and say, I don't get this or I'm upset about this, usually we can resolve those conflicts. I view a church like a family. And, and whereas in our society, families just break apart, they separate, they get divorced. The church doesn't do that. So I invite people to come to me and express their frustrations and, and their worries and their anxieties. And then we say, you know, we're family. We're going to figure this out. And inevitably, the one, the person who's at fault is the youth guy, right? The youth pastor. <laughs> mm-hmm. right? And Always. so we just fire him and get somebody else, right? And that's a joke, right? <laughs> but, but we talk as family members and we try to find resolution. And I found that when people just sit down with their leaders, uh, things can get resolved. So, so that would be a key thing. Uh, that would, that would be changed. And then if we just had conversations with our neighbors, we wouldn't have these vain imaginations and crazy frustrations with one another. We'd actually be able to talk with one another and understand one another. And I have, that's, I think a very high biblical value. Mm. All right. Awesome. Okay. So uh, just uh, the, a culture the last more understanding. Sounds great. Right. The, so the last thing we'd like to do before we get into our intro is our God moment segment. We just, yeah, we're just about to start the podcast. Yeah. Yeah. Before we get into our outro, uh, as our God moment segment, uh, we just take a moment to share something God has done with us recently, whether it be a blessing or a challenge or a moment of worship. And I always make Josh go first. Uh, it gives me more time. It gives you more time. It's just easier this way for most of us. He just enjoys it. But that's <laughs> I um, Mine's going to be pretty simple this time. Um, I'm considering some new... Uh, career options and just really thinking about my future. And um, I've been contacting some of the schools I've gone to, but not finished stuff at and trying to figure out the, uh, what my path forward looks like. And uh, for the first time in a while, it really seems like I have an idea of what I can do. Uh, not necessarily what I will do, but I have an idea of what I can do. And that's, um, you know, it's pretty comforting. So I'll go with that. All right. Awesome. Uh, I will go next just to give our esteemed guest as much time as possible. <laughs> But uh, for me, my God moment is going to be 
uh, it's not really something that happened. It's something that is happening. Uh, you know, I keep getting closer and closer to moving in with some friends of mine and, you know, starting on our next part of life. You know, one is graduating, one is getting out of the Marines. I'm doing neither of those things yet, but it's still <laughs> cool. Uh, so, you know, I'm just thankful that we get the opportunity to do that because not everyone can. So, yeah. Good for me. Um, in the last number of months, God has been sifting me and my wife and our church and discipline, as we read in Hebrews chapter 12, is always tough. It's, uh, it's not pleasant, but I'm seeing the fruit of righteousness that is developing from it. Uh, there's, uh, there's still a lot of junk, and just speaking for myself, a lot of junk, a lot of sin in my own life. And I'm thankful for God's severe mercy and grace to underscore where I've been going wrong and, and, and calling me to repentance, uh, calling me to understand his forgiveness, calling me to grasp the gospel as my one and only true hope. I have not my self-righteousness, not my ability to figure it out, not my ability to make peace things like that. And it's been a hard, but really, really valuable and important lesson that the Lord has been teaching me. And I think it's continuing for a while because <laughs> I'm pretty dull, dumb and, and dull headed. So <laughs> yeah, I can relate right. to that. <laughs> <laughs> Praise God. Uh, You're blessed. Uh, thank you so much for listening to this episode. If you enjoyed it, please consider sharing it with a friend or an enemy. Uh, Dr. Allison, <laughs> uh, we have one more thing for you after the show so yeah um but in the meantime uh, where can people find more of your books and hear more of your ministry um i i'm on facebook that's the only social media <laughs> that i use and then uh, you just uh, google my name greg allison amazon books uh i've got about 15 or so out there if you're interested in uh books my latest one is coming out uh in uh eight days it's called embodied Living as Whole People in a Fractured World. It's a theology of human embodiment. Very, very unusual. You got to love the cover. It's yeah. awesome. I did not design it, but it's by, ba by Baker. I, if you want to look at my books, uh, there's uh, Amazon is a good place to go. Man, I feel like we should have we should have done the episode on your upcoming book. I didn't we, even we know. can I'm do sorry. another one. We'll do another <laughs> one if you want me back. Oh, yeah, absolutely, man. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, maybe we'll find a time after the podcast and we'll, we'll schedule it. Okay. Great. Yeah, that's a, that's a pretty big flex, you know. Okay. You know, if you try to find me, you can Google my name. Uh, that's me. <laughs> I'm that result. But some future guests of the show, we've got uh, Dr. Michael Heiser of the Naked Bible Podcast and author of The Unseen Realm. Uh, return guest, Pastor Chris Galloway, good friend of ours. Uh, former Mennonite and Christian life coach, Gloria Gardon. Garden. One of those words. And, uh, of course, at the end of the season, we will have Francis Chan, hopefully. Yeah, he he just uh, hasn't agreed to a time or anything yet. But, you know, mm -hmm. he, he probably will. Yeah, Francis Chan, when he agrees to be on the podcast, we will end season one. Thanks for you listening. Know, it's funny, I feel like we should just be announcing Matt Chandler each time, because he is going to be on the show. But for some reason, we just decide to just keep doing this. <laughs> Commitment. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but thanks for listening. Uh, come back next week. We love to have you here. We love your support. Have a good one. And if you want to hear what Dr. Allison has left to say, which we're going to make him say, head on over to podcast. Head on over to Patreon and slide us a couple dollars. <laughs> head over to the podcast. <laughs> head over to the podcast. Check it out. All right. That's, uh, that's going to be it for that, I guess. Are you looking for a faith-building podcast all about Jesus? Check out Revealing Jesus with Christina Pereira on Charisma's Podcast Network. This podcast will encourage your faith to believe God for good things, fill you with boldness in your new identity in Christ, and cause your heart to burn with passion for Jesus as we reveal more of His work his gospel with testimonies, teaching, and inspiring interviews with leaders in the body of Christ. 
See how you can join the conversation to reveal more of Jesus today to a hurting world. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. God bless.